Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Stanton Distinguished Leaders Series. My name is Brianna, I'm a senior at Georgetown, and upon graduation I'll be joining City and Capital Markets Origination. I am pleased to introduce Dean Paul Almeida and Mike Corbett, CEO of Citigroup. Paul Almeida is Dean and William R. Berkeley Chair. He is a member of the Georgetown community for more than two decades and has served Georgetown McDonough in a number of positions, including most recently as Deputy Dean for Executive Education and Innovation. He also serves as Professor of Strategy and International Business. Almeida's strategy research focuses on innovation, knowledge management, alliances, and informal collaborations across organizations and countries. He is interested in understanding how knowledge builds across people and organizations and how this affects performance. Our special guest today, Mike Corbett, became CEO in 2012. Before that, he held a variety of roles globally at City, including most recently as CEO of EMEA and CEO of City Holdings. Mr. Corbett has been at City and its predecessor firm since 1983, when he joined Solomon Brothers upon graduating from Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Mike Corbett and Dean Almeida. Thank, thank you, Brianna, uh, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, as you probably know, Brianna is going to be joining City's Capital Market, Markets Organization. So she's going to be both a part of Georgetown and City. And uh, Mike, welcome to the Stanton Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you very much. Uh, Great to be here. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, I've chatted with you a little yesterday and a little today, and I'm even more excited than before. So, uh, Mike, you, you travel a lot, and uh, you've recently been to the World Economic Forum in Davos. Yep. So, uh, for, for your bank, or more generally for the world, what, what are the main takeaways? Uh, people talk a lot, I hear, over there. So what did you take away? They do. Well, first, first, before we go there, I want to say hello, and I want to say thank you for taking time and joining us. I was saying to Paul earlier that um, while I can't exactly describe the formula or the secret sauce, uh, there's a great relationship between City and Georgetown, yeah. and, and not just the School of Business, but broadly Georgetown. I think this year we have 58. Yeah. Uh, Georgetown matriculating, who will be joining City, and that's a pretty consistent number for us. So uh, it's a thrill to be here, it's an honor to be here, and whatever you're doing here, keep doing it, because as these people come to City, they do great jobs. Great. So going to your question, I, this was um, probably about my 10th Davos. And one of the things that uh, I've always done when I've gone, probably after the first one, is I always try and judge the state of the world and how things are going, and I try and make a prediction because very typically, I, I almost can't name the year where I've gone in with uh, an expectation or the world's been viewed a certain way, and it hi either hasn't accelerated or deteriorated uh, from perception coming out of Davos. Mm -hmm. And it, it probably comes as no surprise. I went in this year believing that uh, we were going in with people feeling pretty good and that it would likely, very likely, go to the positive, but I underestimated by how much it would go to the positive. Mm -hmm. I put a big footnote on that of saying that in other people have said it, that Davos is probably one of the best contraindicators out there. <laughs> because this very smart group of business people have a very hard time predicting actually yeah, yeah. Uh, the future. And so, you know, when you think of the backdrop of what's going on right now or how we finished the year, the 2017 was really the, the first year that we've seen of global synchronized growth in a long, long time. And so it wasn't just so the, some of the momentum that we had in the U.S., but really interesting. Usually Europe comes in and Europe is a bit more pessimistic, but Europe came in very pleasantly surprised that Europe was actually growing faster than the U.S. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to have our board in Japan in late October, and I've been going to Japan since the late 80s, and uh, I haven't been in Japan at a point in time where they've been more optimistic. And so you think of all the years post-crisis of the disappointments around growth, and it finally came together, 
And you've obviously, we've all been watching a bit what's gone on in terms of the US markets and some of the euphoria and some of the optimism that's there. And so everybody came in optimistic, and I would say people left even more optimistic as you'd meet your European or Asian counterpart and you would reinforce how good things are back home. Wow. So the economics looks, look really good. What about the geopolitical situation? Were there any worries about that? Anything to keep you up at night? I, I know you don't sleep, but uh, if you did sleep. sleep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you know, when you, you think about, and uh, there was a number of panels that touched on this. I was on a panel paraphrasing that was, what, where does the next financial crisis come from? And I was on with David Rubenstein, and I was on with Jess Daly, who runs Barclays, um, the person who runs a large asset management firm in, um, in Europe. And I think we, would, we all felt that it's likely that the next financial crisis probably um, is driven or more likely to be driven by geopolitical challenges mm -hmm. than challenges at least near to intermediate term coming out of the uh, financial system. And if you think about today, you know, one of the, the things as we look at the markets today, I think that's very interesting, and I talked a bit about this at Davos, is uh, one of the things I talked about that we've got to be mindful of is uh, we've just come out of a year where we had 12 un uninterrupted months of month over month gains. First time, I believe, in the history of the mm -hmm. stock market that we've, we've had that. And uh, you'd say that that happened against a backdrop of some pretty interesting things in North Korea, some mm -hmm. challenges in the Middle East, some questions in the US. Uh, obviously, you know, we've gone through Brexit. And one of the questions I always ask a number of our clients, I said, well, why is this happening? Because if you look at all these things that have gone on, and it really started back with Brexit, and it happened with President Trump, is that we kind of went right through these events. If you remember those events, I remember being up in the middle of the night during Brexit, and the market was off, and I think I went to bed for about an hour and a half before heading to the office, came in the office, it turned right around and took off. Yeah. I remember sitting there on election night with President Trump, and the market was down 800 points, and it turned around and it went. And you look today, and you look at North Korea and some of the things I mentioned, and you say, well, why isn't the market reacting? Mm -hmm. And the asset managers and you know, some of the people we would describe as smart money say, well, we sold Brexit, we bought it back higher. We sold Trump, we bought it back higher. And so we're not gonna sell. We're not gonna sell until we really think we're kind of forced to sell. And we can talk more about it, but what I think is very positive about the last 36 hours is it's a great reminder that yeah. things do go down. And financial markets yeah. tend to have short memories. And I think it's a, it's a great correction. And you, know, you ask yourself, you know, what changed since you know, last week where everything was fine? Not a lot, but eventually we knew there would be something that changed it. And so, yeah. It's an interesting time. A little sobering. Is, I, and I think appropriately yeah, so. Yeah, Just yeah. to remind us. Again, if you go back and you look at, at the Dow year over year, it's still up 20%. Yeah. So. So a little different question on Davos. So there, there were lots of different speakers, right? D did anyone stick out? Did you remember anyone or a particular line or a theme that you said, OK, this is something new or different or interesting? Well, I think if you, if you think of, Paul, the three headline speakers that I would, I mean, again, it's a, it's a bit of a who's who, and the yeah, people you get yeah, to listen yeah. to is pretty extraordinary. But there were three, I think, that had the ability and were probably showcased a bit more than other in no particular order. Mr. Modi was there. And I think the story of what's going on in India and the sustained growth and a lot of the reforms and changes that he's putting through is a fascinating story to listen to and to hear him tell it and the passion with which he tells it, very powerful. I think the second piece was around, or the second one was around President Macron. And if you look at what's happening in, in, in terms of uh, the, the French elections and in some ways what I would call the emergence of a new leader, in some ways maybe taking Ms. Merkel's mantle 
as she's had mm -hmm. some more challenges yeah. around yeah. a coalition government. And the French have really emerged right now as the voice of Europe, and in particular, uh, probably been the strongest voice in terms of the negotiations uh, on the Brexit front. And I think President Macron has done a spectacular job of unifying the country to the point I had breakfast with the finance minister was there, and our entire breakfast was around uh, the fact that France is going to be instituting tax reform and likely lowering corporate tax rates in France to 25%. Four years ago, if you would ask me that, I, I would have yeah. bet against that all day long. Wow. And, and obviously the third was having President Trump there. Yeah. And so uh, it, it, what's fascinating is when you travel around, around the world, in particular outside the United States, every meeting, every meeting I always has is, so tell me about your president. They all want to know, all want to know about, about President Trump. And a, a funny story, he came in on a Thursday and there was a small cocktail reception. And I'm guessing there was maybe 60 CEOs at the reception, uh, probably two-thirds U.S., third rest of world, and he came into the room, and it was not that big a room, and he, he had a speech in his pocket, and he reached into his pocket, and he took his speech out, and he looked at it for a second, he folded it back up, and he dropped it on the floor. <laughs> and he said, right now, my staff is getting really nervous, and he, he gave a, a, a series of what he's really good at of impromptu remarks, or, or um, I won't say he's necessarily always good at, but what's most yeah. fun to listen to, <laughs> most fun to listen to is a series of impromptu remarks around his view of U.S. growth and why U.S. growth is not just important and tried to address in his comments there, which was really a prelude to the next day, of it is in his mind and his administration America first, but it's not America first truly to the detriment that it's the U.S. is, it, in his words, the intention to bring others along. And I think that, that was interesting to, to hear him talk about. Great. So now to switch to technology, I'm sure you get lots of questions on technology, whether it's blockchain or artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, et cetera, et cetera. Some people say technology is disrupting industries. It's at least going to dislocate or change many industries. What does technology mean for city and for the banking sector? Well, one, Paul, is it's, it's refreshing because typically, I would have, we're 18 minutes in, and, and we haven't talked about blockchain yet. <laughs> Everywhere I go, every, Okay, I take every, that back. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm sure at some point it's coming. Um, you know, you look at technology. Technology is, it's very easy to say and very true. It's changing the face of everything we do. And what's in many ways to me in banking most exciting about technology is a lot of things we do, it happens behind the scene mm -hmm. and it happens to the benefit of the company or happens in certain ways. But when I really look at the application of technology today, it's really being driven and truly benefiting our customers' and clients' lives. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the application of technology today, there's really two things that most affects, which most resonate. One is the speed with which you can get things done. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with that speed, actually reduce frictions in people's lives. The frictions around how much communication or how much time or how much things cost and all those pieces, and so it absolutely enhances the customer-client experience, and at the same time, makes our lives easier. And that's, in many ways, what's so exciting, because rarely do you get those things as well aligned as what's going on. And as I say, uh, as I will say to the 58 um, Hoyas who are joining us, uh, and I'll say to everybody that joins us, is there's not, um, uh, I got, called out in terms of how old I am. I'm, I'm in my 35th year and I feel extremely comfortable mm -hmm. in saying and declaring that there is not a more interesting time to be in banking because right now we are just at the start of truly rewriting the next chapter of banking. The technology is gonna dominate that story and it's yeah. gonna be incredible fun. And so what, you, you mentioned the 58 Hoyas who are joining you. Compared to, say, five years ago, uh, 
what kinds of skills or capabilities are going to be even more valued or needed for the Hoyas joining you now or next year, the year after? One, one is, um, is an attribute, and that's mindset and approach. You know, when we think about, so when I joined the company, we came and um, you put your head down and you went to work, and as I called it, it was the, the mentality of shut up and suffer, mm. right? And, and, and you kind of did what you, you needed yeah. to do and you learned along the way, we are an yeah. apprentice business. I think today, you're, you're involved in so many things at such an earlier point in your career, you've got the ability to be so much more impactful because as we evolve as a firm, it's not my generation that's going to change the firm. I'm going to create the space and I'm going to empower, but it's the people coming in that are going to drive the change in the firm. And so when you think about and the empowerment that comes with that and the things that we're giving, and so the skill sets are inquisitive. You know, one of the things we've spent a lot of time because it's the exact opposite of where we used to be around failure. You know, when I came in, you never wanted to fail. You know, failure was, it was over. Bad. And now it's failure and fast learning. Not if you fail, but you know, why, what did you learn, and how are you gonna pick yourself up and go back at it and make all of us better as a result of, of, of what you learned? And we've instituted a number of programs around one we call Discovery 10X, D10X. How do we, how do we change the culture of the company? And so one thing that I think as a company we're good at, we're, we're good and historically good at what we, what we call big to bigger. We take big things and we get bigger at them. The skill we've had to learn and where the people coming in have probably been most effective is new to big. How do we take new things and make those big? And that's a different mindset from where we've been as a, been as a company. Now, uh, we, we're talking about our students, and I would say a high percentage of Georgetown students want to be a CEO one day, right? <laughs> so how did you get to be CEO, and what advice can you give our students who want to fill your shoes and sit in your chair one day? So, so one, I would say I was at a distinct disadvantage having not gone to Georgetown. Yeah. <laughs> so I probably... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Harvard's just not quite... Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I would start out by, by admitting, and for those that have worked for me, um, I would probably declare myself in some ways as the unexpected CEO. Okay. That in 2011, I moved back to Europe for the second time, and I thought I would probably be there and likely end my career, and then shortly thereafter, a phone call came to come back and to, and to do this. Uh, but if I think of my journey to get here, it really is that within our company, I've had multiple, multiple careers. And there's um, some of my partners here in the room who've shared those journeys with me. Oftentimes, the things that we did or the things that I took on, they were broken or they were suboptimal. And I enjoyed taking a shot at trying to fix them and make them better and get them going and then moving on mm -hmm. to the next thing. And so when I think of my 35 years at our company, I've probably had a dozen careers in there. And so I've run trading businesses, capital markets businesses, banking businesses. I've run consumer banking businesses. I've run geographies for the company. Mm. And so when the time came, I actually had the ability to, to look and understand the company as an insider. And, you know, probably like any of us, you know, in the second drawer down on the right, I had my yellow legal pad that said, if I'm ever CEO, here's the things I'm going to do. <laughs> and so you take that out and you go to work. And we've just got great people. We've got an extraordinarily resilient company and a phenomenal business model. And so we just kind of went to work and tried to apply some of my learnings, but really take our talent and let it loose and let it do the things that I, I, knew, I knew it could do. So were you always entrepreneurial? But did you seek new challenges? Because, as you said, you, you've had lots of different jobs within the same company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was so never afraid of change. Embrace change. Uh, never afraid to try something new. Uh, 
uh, you know, I was fortunate again to have great people around me and be supported and the company was extremely supportive, but just to have that ability to see and do so many things and to, the ability to have so many careers within a firm. And one thing I talk to our people who are joining us about is don't sell the company short. And by that, what I mean is that, you know, today we know with um, your generation, if we're not engaging you, you're likely engaging with somebody else. So one of the, the promises that we make is we promise to meet you more than halfway. You have to own your careers, as you should. You should be investing in your careers, as part of that. But we're going to invest right alongside you. And within the firm, you can go do all kinds of things. You want to go have an international assignment. We opened up this morning in 100 countries around the world. We've got all the businesses and many more I just talked about. And when you think of the relevance of the things we're doing, and from a technology perspective, we've got over 10,000 technologists coming to work every day in the firm. We've got an operating budget of about $17 billion that we're spending on the copper combination of technology and how we use that in the operations of the firm. And so there's so many things you can do. So before you get up and you move across the street or you move somewhere else and you lose that capital that you've built of your reputation and your work ethic and all the things you do to go start over somewhere else, why not do it at the same place? Pick mm -hmm. it up, move it over. Your Thank reputation you. precedes you in a positive way if, if, if we're moving you to do those things and take advantage of that. So you mentioned you're in over 100 countries. We've talked about tech, technology and technological change. Is managing a multinational becoming more complex and are the tools to, that help us manage it uh, up to the task? Is there just too much complexity, you think? Outside? Well, we've taken a lot of complexity out. When we uh, came out of the crisis, you know, what we've, we've talked about is we've, we've absolutely made ourselves simpler. And so if you go back and study the banking industry, sometime between 2000 and 2007, most of the big institutions in the world were on a, a path towards wanting to be a or the financial supermarket, everything to everyone. I think what we all learned coming out of the crisis is that's not a viable business model. Mm -hmm. And so what we really did is looked at where we felt we could distinguish ourselves and differentiate ourselves and provide that value. And for us, that was really around two axes. One is we're a bank. We'd become not only a bank, but an insurance company, an asset manager, a hedge fund, private equity, you name it, we were in it, back to our roots of being a bank. And second is our globality. And um, in spite of a lot of the rhetoric going on, we don't see the world becoming any less global. Trade corridors and trade routes and trade agendas may change, but globalization and what it's done yes. is not going backwards and that we could distinguish ourselves in our business model by being the world's most global bank. And that's what we took the institution to. We shed a lot of businesses, uh, we simplified our business model, became hyper-focused on our customer and client bases and our product, uh, both physical and intellectual product offerings, uh, and, and it's really gained traction. And so that's made it much simpler, simpler, to, simpler to, to be able to, much less complex to be able to manage. I was going to say, I have exactly the same strategy as you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one, there are lots of differences between higher ed and banking and financial services, but I think we both face a fairly dynamic world out there, changing markets, changing competition, inputs, outputs, everything. And so I believe we have to innovate uh, at the business school, at the university, like you, we're an old institution, over 200 years old. So how do you get an old institution, an old organization to embrace the future and embrace change and continuously innovate? We, we've, got, we've got a bunch of that in our DNA. And I, I, I always tell the story, I like to tell the story, that we were one of the earliest disruptors. So like you, we are now 206 years old. And the company, Citibank, was founded 
in 1812 by a group of New York City businessmen who feared that New York City was losing out to the port cities of Baltimore and Boston, <laughs> and that they needed an independent bank to finance trade. And so we were formed in 1812 as a trade bank, again, going back to what I, I just described. And interestingly, one of the first things that we financed was a very disruptive company of its time. It's called the Black Ball Shipping Line. And the Black Ball Shipping Line came up with this very uh, different idea at the time. So at the time, a ship would sit on the dock. When it was full, it would eventually go. And you didn't necessarily know when it was going to arrive because you didn't know when it was going to leave and you didn't know when it would be full and depart. Right. And so if you were f shipping any type of perishables, it was very difficult to gauge. The Black Ball shipping line came up with this very novel idea of saying that every Thursday, regardless of the ship being full or not, the ship is going to sail, and based on the winds and the currents, you could predict wherever it was going roughly when it would get there. And it totally revolutionized mm -hmm. shipping yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the first things we did. And then if you go through the history of the company and the things that we uh, continue to do today, so you know, one of the things we've most recently done is we're the uh, first bank in the world to actually introduce uh, a mobile device that gives you the ability to borrow, save, protect, spend, and invest right on your phone, all off of one function. Now, we're there first. We probably won't have that lead for a long time. But again, it's around the mindset mm -hmm. of, of being able to, to, do those, to do those types of things. And so the DNA is there, which is great. But then it's empowering. And it goes back to a little bit about what I mentioned of kind of changing the mentality of failure and the right ways being acceptable, uh, the way we experiment, the way we test. Uh, and the way we do things and the way we try and put the client at the front of everything we do forces you to be innovative because the clients today are very demanding. If you're not giving them the speed, if you're not taking the frictions out that we talked about, they're gone. So, as, you know, as the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention, yeah, but, but yeah. we like to be in front of it. Great. Uh, as you know, we're a Jesuit school and uh, with Ignatian principles. And uh, what, one of our core values is we're here to serve the common good, to make a difference to the world. Now, some critics, uh, sometimes they're politicians, sometimes they're in the media, sort of portray banks as being far removed from that ideal of here to serve the common good. How do, how do you see it? Banks, you know, when you go back and you, and you look at the creation of banks, banks were formed at the ethos of common good. Mm. It was a place where we could actually match communities in mm. terms of those mm. that had deposits or money to put them in a safe place, and at the same time, take those monies and relend them back into the community for housing and jobs and all the things that come as a result of that velocity of money being reintroduced. And banks are core and central to the communities that they, they live in and that they work in. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think going back, and, and I think banks did lose their way in that era that I described of this arms race around becoming the yeah. financial supermarket. Yeah. Yeah. And it became more about product and more about growth and less about necessarily the client centricity. And I think post-crisis, certainly we have, but I think the industry has found its way back Im importantly to what that means. And I look at today of what we do, and um, we're, not, we're not great at telling our own story. And again, uh, my own approach is do the right things and the other things follow. But as an example, um, uncelebrated, but we're the, the largest, you know, we're not the largest bank in the United States, but we're the largest lender to low and middle income housing finance in the United States. Uh, we've been first for the last 10 years in terms of our pledge towards the environment. And we've got a $100 billion 10-year commitment of investment into the environment. The things we're doing in inner city schools around, you can Google or search something called Pathways to Progress, where one of the big challenges in inner cities is jobs training and job skills for youth. That, that likely is not 
finishing necessarily not a college, but in some cases not a high school. And our pledge around those were the things that our foundation are doing, or more importantly, you know, one of the things I'm extremely proud of is the way our employees. You know, every June we have Global Community Day, and last year we had well over 100,000 of our employees go back into wow. their communities wow. and, and spend not just their day, but in some cases multiple days giving back. And as I travel the United Way and cause after cause that our people take on. So we take that responsibility very seriously. And, and, and in there, the reinforcement is, is as we do that, uh, we get the feedback and we know it means a lot to our employees. Wait. So you're really a Jesuit institution. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Just wanted to make well, sure. But with, with one proviso, <laughs> we're actually for profit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, in a minute, we're going to take questions from the audience. But before we do that, uh, do you have any final words? By the way, you are good at telling your story. <laughs> you said we're not. Uh, do you have any final words of wisdom for uh, students who may want to be a part of City one day? Sure. So, probably at this point you're, you're figuring out your careers and that in many cases as you think about that, you probably have very specific things or very specific jobs that you ultimately want to get to. And so I'm always interested in some ways always I won't say amazed, but taken when I meet somebody and they're 20, 21 years old, an undergraduate, and I said, what do you want to do? They say, I want to be a technology banker, and I want to live in Palo Alto, and I want to cover <laughs> fang companies or whatever it is. And I would tell you that those aspirations are phenomenal, but I'm going to ask you to fight that urge for now, and whether you're undergrad or graduate, build your foundation. And your foundation is around all the skills that you need to get, because your life and your career will very naturally narrow. And those of you that have the best foundation will have the most flexibility in your careers. And so when you think about a world, Paul, that we've described that's likely to continue to change very rapidly, I don't know about you, but I want as much flexibility, optionality in my career as I can have, because we don't know where some of these things are going to go. And if you get too narrow too fast, you're going to find yourself, in some cases, uh, not where you want to be and not having the flexibility. And then in some of those cases, you're going to have to go backwards to go forwards. And that's never, yeah. that's, that's never a, a pleasant thing. Sometimes it's necessary, and it's fine. But if you can spend more time investing in that base for a period of time, your careers will naturally narrow and naturally take care of themselves. That's, that's wonderful advice. So uh, wel welcome uh, questions from the audience. I think we have two microphones. Uh, please feel free. Uh, hello, my name is Antonia. I'm a senior at the MSB. So you're talking about the foundations. I want to uh, learn more about what would you say are the top three most important skills for business school graduates to gain? The, th the, the top three skills? Yeah. So um, I think there's the basics that are there that, that just have to be the foundation of anything, and that's integrity, it's hard work, uh, it's intellectual curiosity, true intellectual curiosity around things. Um, at a place like City, your ability and desire to, to work and be part of a successful team, that teamwork and the things we do based on the global nature of our company uh, is, is extremely, extremely Important, and I would say there's a final attribute, but many, um, many beyond this um, is your, your willingness, not just in terms of intellectual curiosity, but your desire to kind of think outside the box and, and think originally around things. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Hi, Mr. Corbett. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Um, my question is, if you weren't, 
the CEO of City, what would you be doing right now, uh, <laughs> personally, out of passion? Wow. Um. <laughs> How have I done in life up till now? <laughs> uh, exceedingly well. Uh, well, I can tell you that, that uh, so one is, one thing I really enjoy is, and, and it's, it's different. You know, when I was coming out of undergrad, I was quite entrepreneurial. I had my own business, and I always thought I would be an entrepreneur, and I, uh, uh, had a chance to join Solomon Brothers back in 1983 at the time, and I thought at the time, you know what, I'm going to go, I'll give it five years, and then I'll go figure out what I'm going to do. And uh, 35 years later, here I am, as I said to Paul, I, I just couldn't get a job anyplace else, so I stayed. <laughs> and, but I always thought I would, be, I, I would be entrepreneurial, but what I really enjoy about my job is the nature of, yes, we are big, but having the challenge and having the opportunity to move an, inst an institution. And I know that, as an example, I know that Colin Powell was here. And he talked about the art of leadership without influence. Yes. And so this challenge of, I, I think I, I have a little bit of influence uh, within, our, within our firm, but how do you get this institution to move? How do you create the right behaviors? And it's not just how do I create the right behaviors in Japan or China or Russia or wherever it may be and make sure that the firm is linked up, but it's through the organization. And how do we get the messages down? And importantly, what we call the tone from the top, and importantly, what's the echo coming back up? And to me, that's fascinating to, to, to be able to do that. Uh, my guess is if I wasn't here, I probably would have done something in its day, entre entrepreneurial. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the challenges of, of something big, and so happy to, happy to keep doing this. Thank you very much. Have you ever considered being a professor next? <laughs> <laughs> I have. I, I know a few schools. <laughs> hey, th thank you. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. Um, yeah, I have a question kind of related to the president. The Economist a couple of weeks ago published an article that said uh, the tax reform in U.S. It is good for U.S., but the bad for the whole world. Uh, what do you think about the U, uh, U.S. tax reform uh, for the global finance market, bad or good aspects? Thank you. Well, let's start with the U.S. It's a great, it's a great question, and it's, it's heavily debated, and, and time, time will tell. But, you know, as I look at the U.S. economy, and we go back and think about the crisis, and coming out of the crisis, we had a couple issues, um, but a, a primary thing to solve. And that is, remember, coming out of the crisis, U.S. economy, $17 trillion economy, two-thirds of the U.S. economy is driven by the consumer. And when we think of a U.S. consumer, two things to a consumer matter. One, my largest investment is typically my home. Is it going up? Is it staying the same or going down in value? Coming out of the crisis, housing going down. So my biggest investment is depreciating. Second component of that is, do I have a job? If I have a job, am I going to keep it? And if I uh, don't have a job, what's my prospects of getting one? And you remember at the end of the crisis, unemployment approaching 10%. So we saw not just the Fed, but we saw the Bank of England, we saw the ECB, we've seen the Bank of Japan all act around forms of quantitative easing to stimulate their economies, really trying to, in many cases, shore up those two things. The easier piece was housing. So as we cut rates, housing became more affordable. We got a floor into housing and housing did well. And jobs were tougher uh, as we did that. Fast forward to today, housing is you know, at or above pre-crisis levels, and unemployment is back to levels at or below where we were going into the crisis. But the US economy in 2017 grew at 2.2%. That's not sustainable based on the, the fiscal situation and the structure of entitlements in the US. And so the question to the politicians either side of the aisle and to this administration was, we've got to figure out a way to get more growth in the U.S. So how do we do that? Well, we've just said that two-thirds of the U.S. economy is the consumer. 
we got jobs, we got housing, uh, we've got all those things in a pretty good place, and so we're likely not, as a direct impact, going to change that mindset. Consumer confidence is pretty good. And so what's the other part of the puzzle? Well, the other third is around companies. And what do we see coming from companies? And as I travel the US and as I travel the world and have the ability to sit down with CEOs, and I always ask them the same question, pretty basic question. Tell me about your business. And almost regardless of industry, and almost regardless of country, the paraphrased answer is, it's okay. Top line's tough. We're getting a little bit of growth. I'm managing expenses tight. I'm being stingy on hiring and CapEx. I'm not investing in my company where I really should be. But I, I just feel, based on where things are, this is about the best I can do. And so what I would say we're beginning to see in the US, and we've seen it in the markets, is a transition where if you go back and you ask those business leaders, tell me about your business, in general, they, they became optimistic. Mm -hmm. And then the question was, what's the catalyst when you move that business from being optimistic to confident? And so when I'm optimistic, I'm planning, I'm thinking about things. When I'm confident, I act. I hire, I spend, I invest. And the whole belief behind the tax move is a couple fold. Is one is the average global tax rate in the world's about 25%. The US was at 35%. This now makes the US competitive. And that we will shift companies from being optimistic to confidence and we'll see the investment. And I think you've started to see that manifest itself uh, in certain ways. And so from a US perspective, it doesn't necessarily take north of 3% growth to solve the problems, but it needs to be consistently north of 2.5 or 2.6, 2.7, the numbers I've seen, uh, to pay for the way the scoring is done around it. And early signs is there's some chance to be able to do that. In terms of the, the, the sound bite that U.S. tax reform or U.S. tax reductions are bad for the rest of the world. I think it puts pressure on the rest of the world, but I can argue the other side that's saying it's not bad. That, that in there, we've got a bunch of governments around the world that aren't being as run as well as they should. And, and I, I won't pick on any one, but I'll take Europe as an example. I think Mr. Draghi has done a spectacular job around monetary policy of buying the EU time. A true lack of, from my perspective, political follow through on getting reforms done. And so those governments are bloated and they need to be pressured into making the decisions to create the right fiscal sustainability. And if the US in terms of moving its tax rate put some of that pressure there, I can argue that there's a, a positive side. What we don't want to see, and I don't think it's likely to happen, that we end up in some kind of tax war, tax race to the bottom, where uh, you know, we end up just you know, competing uh, based on tax rates. I, I, don't, I don't see that as a necessarily a real threat, because I don't necessarily see the the political fortitude to get the reforms done that are necessary to do that. But I think the pressures around modernizing governments, around reform, streamlining, et cetera, is, is a healthy pressure for the world, and it's overdue. Thank you. Sorry for the long answer. Oh. Go, go ahead. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, You've talked a little bit about the recent readjustment um, in the stock market as a good thing. Um, but I, I wondered, do you see uh, city or financial institutions at large having any kind of responsibility in dampening the kind of boom and bust cycle that we've seen uh, in free market economies over the, the last, I don't know, five decades? Well, I think there's a, there's a, a, a broad responsibility that we've talked a little bit about. And, and you know, one of the things that we, 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 we need to and we do take very seriously is making sure that around financial instruments, they're in the right hands. And I think if you go back and you look pre-crisis, in the last couple of days, there's been a lot of talk about leverage 
and some of the leverage and some of the active versus passive strategies? And do people really understand or necessarily understand what they own? I think big responsibility of the financial system is making sure that uh, we get those instruments or those investments into the right hands such that they were judged properly and people understand the risk. Because the biggest challenges you can have is when people don't understand the risk and they get surprised, it creates all kinds of, of negative outcomes. So I would say that's one responsibility. I think second, second responsibility is that you know we've got a, 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 I think not just a regulatory, but a moral obligation to be there and in times of need and crisis, providing liquidity into those markets. Again, the markets are big. The markets are bigger than any one financial institution, but we have a role in terms of providing as best we can and using our resources around that liquidity. So as people choose to buy and sell and at points of stress or at points of opportunity, have the ability to, to take advantage uh, of those. And I think as part of that, you know, a broader responsibility in terms of the way we act and behave not to exacerbate or exaggerate those uh, scenarios as they're unfolding. And so I'm very pleased, you know, when I looked at, um, you know, when we knew coming in on Sunday night and coming in Monday that it was likely to be a volatile day, it was likely to be lots of volume that, you know, when we got to the end of trading sessions, which started in Japan and, and ended in New York, that we very much lived up to our responsibilities that, that we set out to do that. Uh, but you just don't measure those things over, over one day. Just to digress for a second, I also think that there's a responsibility from the press in this. And that, you know, today, um, you know, I have a 92, 93 year old dad who kind of flips between hurricanes on the Weather Channel <laughs> and you know CNBC, and and y you've got to be careful what's said as part of those. And I actually sent Jim Cramer a note this morning that I heard him for about five minutes, and I thought the way he described things was very responsible. So I applauded him in terms of his social responsibility of not. Uh, you know, having everybody thinking the world was coming to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Corbett. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm a senior in the MSP. Um, my question revolves around one of the comments you made earlier and um, at Davos as well. You mentioned that cities kind of slimming down and getting rid of some of their uh, non-core businesses. But while like a private equity firm or insurance city might seem kind of crazy now. At one point, I think that might have been an interesting story for investors as a growth opportunity for the firm. So as City focuses on its core competencies, do you believe that that means that there has to be more consolidation in the banking industry? And then do you believe that that presents a greater risk for systemically important financial institutions in the next financial crisis? Well, we, um, I'm gonna take that question backwards. Uh, interesting question. So. One is, do we think that the move in business models has made the institutions and the system more systemically vulnerable? I would argue no. Um, and, and I've talked about this a number of times publicly. So what, as I look at it, what I actually think is actually very healthy. Because if you go back 10 years, and 10 years ago, it was Citi and JP and Bank of America and HSBC and Standard Chartered and Barclays, all with an identical business model, all wanting to be everything to everyone. And a great example I give, two great firms that illustrates exactly this point. 10 years ago, go back and do your work and compare Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, two fantastic institutions. They were indistinguishable from each other in terms of their business models. Today, look at them, very different. And, and what we've seen the industry do, and what we've done at City, as I described, is go back to our areas of strength and our areas of competitive advantage. And so what we don't have is all these homogenous business models that when things go wrong, all the same things go wrong at all of them. So one, I would argue that the system today is systemically in a, in a very different place. You are right in the way we think about and talk about growth in our company is very different from how we talked about growth in the past. So growth in the past is what are we going to go buy? What's the new thing we're going into? What's the new country we're opening? 
and it was you know, really scope creep in terms of, and that's where growth came from. Today, our business model is extremely refined. As you described, we're done. We've shed the things that we don't want. We've got a business model we love. And how do we get more out of what we do? And as we think about and challenge ourselves, it's around differentiating ourselves. And rather than all those new things, how do we gain share of mind with our clients around the things that they're doing? And that goes back to making sure that we're providing the intellectual content as well as the physical or digital capabilities to, to enable the things and enhance the things that they, they want to do. So growth looks and feels different, but we're, we're excited and think that the company is, is in a position, uh, as we have been for the last few years here, to be a, to be a winner in that race. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Alexander Simon, I'm a junior in the School of Foreign Service studying science, technology, and international affairs. Um, I, my question is about what you said about the need to take technology from new to big instead of from big to bigger. I was hoping, if you, I was hoping you could quickly um, speak more to that and how you envisioned that process. So, you know, when you, you think of what technology is, is driving today, it, it's it, in many ways completely changing the way that we interact with our clients. And you know, we, we have a, um, so when you, you, I'll give you a great, a great example of things that are changing and, and are going to change. We were having the conversation about credit cards earlier. And so you think about credit cards today. And um, about nine months ago, I, I, I do business reviews with all of my businesses every quarter. And I started the business review. And by the way, the City Prestige Cards is a great card. <laughs> um, <laughs> I started the meeting by taking all of my, my cards, all of my city cards out, <laughs> and putting them on the table. And if you have a city card on the back, you, you see that we have not only one, but two phone numbers on every card. So I started the meeting by asking our head of our credit card business, I said, would you do me a favor? Would you call Amazon? I've got a question for them. And there's a whole bunch of people in the room, and they're kind of looking at each other, and they don't know what to do. They don't know if I'm serious mm -hmm. or, or, or not. And, uh, I'm sure to them it felt like an eternity. About 30 seconds later, I said, we all know the answer. The answer is if I give you 15 minutes, you'll actually never get anybody on the phone at Amazon for me to speak to. Yet, their customer satisfaction in many of their lines is higher than ours. And we're not only giving one, we're giving two numbers that people can call us. And by the way, on this card, by the way, which is a great card. Uh, <laughs> That, you know, do you think anybody who owns this card doesn't have a data plan? And we're not only providing two phone numbers, one of them is an 800 number and the other number we're telling you to call collect. And by the way, I called procurement that morning and this, that, those two phone lines cost us $55 million a year to encourage people to call us. Uh, why do I tell that story? It's because it's the way things have to change. And the way things have to change is we've got to get to the position where we will interact with you any way that you want to interact with us. Paul and I were having the conversation earlier around the, the pace of te technological change. And, and the way I love to describe it, I describe it as my family. I was telling Paul I've got a 92-year-old dad, grew up in the Depression in the US, spends no money, thinks he's going broke every day, <laughs> checks his balance five times a day. I called him up and said, Dad, great news for you. We're changing your account and you can just interact with us digitally, he'd be challenged because he forgets his pin every day. And if we said that, realistically, he wouldn't want to do that. Saying to Paul, kind of take it to our generation, uh, we, we like both. I like having my device, I can check my balances, I can send money, I can receive money, I can do all those things, but I also have somebody I can go to when I want something. And most of you really only want to interact with us digitally. And so what we can't do is we can't get too far ahead of any of you, right? We've got to deliver to you the digital capabilities. We've got to deliver to my generation the combination of physical and digital. And we've got to deliver to my dad largely an a, uh, uh, analog experience. And so as you, as you think about that, but to make sure, and the way we describe it as a team, we need to stay just ahead so that we're, we're giving you the things that you want, 
You're excited by the things that we're offering, but we're not losing you. And in many ways, financial services up till now has gone slower than most industries. As an example, the ATM was introduced in the United States by city in 1977. The ATM, a lot of people lay claim for the ATM. The ATM was actually invented in a garage in Sweden, in Stockholm. It was commercialized. A fellow John Reed, who was running our company at the time, saw it, commercialized it. And John, at that point in time, um, John, MIT trained. John, most recently, was chairman of the board of MIT. John looked and said, we need no more branches. We're going to stop investing in so branches. Today, you know, I still see John all the time. <laughs> and um, great example of John's not wrong, but he was 30 years early. Right? So if you look at, you know, you look at, we finally just seen, I don't know if you saw the article, maybe it was today or yesterday, forget, lose track of, of the, the, the stories. Branch count has finally turned down. After 30 years, after the introduction of the ATM, branch count finally turned down and is beginning to reduce. Not wrong. And so ours is, is this, tr this trick or this, this thing we've got to get right of making the investments, being out in front, but not getting so far in front you lose the crowd behind you. And that's a little bit of the, the magic or the secret sauce around, around technology. And so we're going to continue to challenge ourselves. As I said, we're investing lots of money in it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and in many ways, a lot of the things that are out there, we've, we pers personify big data and our ability. You know, we, we're the largest mover of money every day in the world. We move about $4.5 trillion of money runs through our system. So think of the information that that money's going from governments, companies, people, where it's going, what it's buying, what it's being used for, and the information that's in there. Uh, we're the world's largest issuer of, of credit cards. And if I told you that black card is really good. Um, <laughs> the information that's there, we've got 150 million people in the world that carry a city piece of plastic. That piece of plastic is going away. That's not a big deal, right? We'll, we'll move to electronic payments. but having those flows and understanding and then being able to customize and to push things to those people that make sense for them and actually uh, not only giving them but protecting their digital identities. I think that's a huge theme. Around today, we give our digital identities away all the time. As a bank, I actually think our responsibility in the future is actually going to be on your behalf safeguarding that digital identity and helping you protect it and monetize it potentially as you, you go forward. So lots of interesting things. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, <laughs> thank you. that hour went past very, very fast. But uh, th thank you for all the wonderful insights for intriguing us in so many ways. And if you can lend me that black card, uh, you know, <laughs> I just need to write down some numbers, uh, you know. But uh, th thank you so much for sharing your insights on business and leadership and exciting us about the future. Uh, thank you to the, everyone from Citigroup that's here. Wh who's from Citigroup? Uh, thank you all for being here. <laughs> wonderful. And, and Paul, if I can, I want to thank yeah. everyone for coming out and, and, and being here and having some interest. And again, if you have any interest in city, let us know. Again, we've got a great relationship with the, the university. And you can check with some of your alumni that I think they've had really good experiences at our company. And we welcome your inquiry. So thank you. Yeah. And we have a reception right now in Fisher Colloquium on the fourth floor. You're welcome to uh, meet. Uh, everyone from Citigroup and uh, each other as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>